Hey, if you got your Bibles with you this morning, we'll be actually in two different places. Uh, but primarily, we will park out in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. I just want to read Genesis 25. Uh, verses 24 through 34, just to kind of give you some context uh, as to what is happening with today's sermon and why the writer of Hebrews says what he says uh, in his book of the Bible. Uh, so if you have a paper Bible with you, that's where we will be. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that is perfectly fine as well. Uh, all those words will appear on the screen behind me this morning that you may be able to follow right along. But before we read this morning, let's go to the Lord once more. In prayer. God, we come today and we worship you. God, we thank you today that you created us for you. That, Lord, you give our lives meaning and purpose in life. And you love us, God. And we worship you today because of that. God, as we come to the preaching of your word, God, we pray for your spirit who inspired these words of scripture to speak to us today. And Lord God, I pray that we would not just be hearers of these words, but that Lord, we would be doers of them. We pray this and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 25, beginning at verse 24. When the time came for her, Rebecca, to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. They would have put him in the circus if he was born today. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, he ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now skipping over to Hebrews chapter 12, where we'll look at verses 16 and 17 this morning. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau who, for a single meal, sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could not bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. I want to start off by asking you all a question this morning. How many of you have ever heard of Charles Templeton. Anybody? Now, how many of you have heard of Billy Graham? Yeah, about all of us in this room this morning, right? So Charles Templeton and Billy Graham were contemporary evangelists. Both of them had a radical conversion to Christ, and both of them were anointed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you had been alive in the 1940s, and if you had known of the ministries of Charles Templeton and Billy Graham, and if you had been a betting person, you would have put your money on Charles Templeton to have the greatest ministry as compared to Billy Graham. So when Charles Templeton was a young man, 
He stumbled out of a Toronto strip club, drunk, staggered home, and then this is what Charles Templeton says happened. Suddenly, it was as though a black blanket had been draped over me. A sense of guilt pervaded my entire mind and body. The only words that could come were, Lord, come down. Lord, come down. And then slowly the weight began to lift. A weight as heavy as I was. It passed through my thighs, my torso, my arms and shoulders, and it lifted off. A warmth began to fill my body. It seemed like a light had turned on in my chest, and it cleansed me. I, my dad, when I was in my early 20s, and he told me, Son, get an IRA, max it out, because now here I am in my 60s, and all I have saved for retirement is $20,000. I wish I would have given more time to my family. I climbed the corporate ladder. I made it. But my wife left me, and my children despise me. I can't tell you how many times I have sat in my office and have listened to the regrets of people. Everything from adultery to drug addictions, you name it. Your decisions have consequences and they will follow you through your life both good and bad. Regret is a part of what it means to be human. Every single one of us in this room are carrying regrets. I carry them, you carry them. Everything from things we wish we wouldn't have said, things we wish we wouldn't have done, the things we wish we would have said, the things we wish we should have done. Hey, there are even two times in the Bible when it says that God had regret. In Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says that God had regretted that he made man because they had become so wicked and evil. The other is 1 Samuel chapter 15, where God says that he had regretted making Saul king because King Saul had become such a self-centered, egotistical king who would not listen to the voice of God. But when the Bible says that God regretted, it is not a sigh of anger. It is a sigh of love. When God regrets, He is looking at people and He is thinking, there is so much more for you than this. But living in sin and rebellion against me is not how it is going to happen. In the book of Hebrews, the, the author of this book, whoever it is, we don't know, but he is writing to Jewish Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. And it is most likely that these Jewish Christians are actually being persecuted by other Jewish people. They are most likely being persecuted by Jewish family, friends, neighbors, and acquaintances because they have forsaken the Old Testament covenant law, and now they have placed their faith in Jesus. Some of them have been thrown into prison. Some of them have had their stuff looted and ransacked. They are being verbally abused. And the temptation for them is to give up on Jesus. That the suffering they are facing is not worth it. And what the writer of Hebrews is doing is he is telling them, no, don't give up on Jesus. Don't do something that you might look back one day and regret that you left your first love. Stick with Jesus. Stay faithful to him. He is worth it. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the Old Testament story about Jacob 
and Esau. But Jacob and Esau were twins who were born to Isaac and Rebekah. And Esau was the firstborn son. And to be the firstborn son in this society was an incredible privilege. It gave you honor. It gave you power. It gave you authority. When your father died, you were the one who divided up the estate. As the firstborn son, you carried on the blessings and promises of God from one generation to the next. But Esau gave it all away for a bowl of stew. Here is what the Bible should actually say. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. That's what it should say, Tommy. But what does the Bible actually say? That God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. So this morning I want to preach on regret. And here is the question I want to answer for you this morning. How do you avoid regret in life? And I want us to look at three things from Hebrews chapter 16, verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. So the first way you re avoid regret is to put God at the center of your life, not you. So we look at the first part of verse 16. See that no one is sexually immoral. That seems like a really odd statement that the writer of Hebrews puts in there before he goes on and talks about Esau. Here's why the writer of Hebrews might be putting this statement in there. Because according to Jewish tradition, wild game wasn't the only thing that Esau was off hunting, if you know what I mean for our older audience. So then he goes on here in the second part of verse 16, or is godless like Esau? So the first thing that the writer of Hebrews says is that Esau was godless. Godless does not mean that you are an atheist. Godlessness just means that you put yourself at the center of your life and God is on the periphery. Esau believed in God. But the problem with Esau was that he placed himself at the center of his life, and God was on the periphery. Esau was a self-centered and selfish person who was careless about the things of God. That is what it means to be a godless person. The opposite of that is a godly life. And it is one where you build your life with God at the center of it. It's a godly reference in how you do your job, how you build your marriage, how you parent your children, how you spend your money, how you spend your time, how you serve the church, how you live your life, how you let God's glory shine through your life Sunday through Sunday. To live a godly life is to put Jesus at the center of it all. And this is one way to avoid regret in your life. November 14th, 2007, changed my wife, Megan, and I, lives forever. Because that is when our first daughter, Addie, was born into this world. And when we held her in our arms for the very first time, y'all, we fell in love with her. 
When we brought her home from the hospital and we laid her in her crib, our lives were radically reoriented around her. Our sleep, our time, our money, our schedules were now all about her. And it's amazing how nothing has changed in 16 years, y'all. 40, <laughs> God bless y'all. One way to avoid regret in your life is to fall in love with Jesus. It's to radically reorient your life around Him. It's to love Him and serve Him and give your full devotion to Christ. That everything about your life, from your marriage to your parenting to how you do your job to how you spend your money your time, it's all done to bring glory to the name of Jesus. This is how you live a godly life. And it is one way to avoid regret in your life. Number two is this. If you want to avoid regret, you live for the eternal, not the temporal. Look at the second half of verse 16. Who, for a single meal, sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Esau failed to do this. The physical hunger was so great that he signed over his birthright to feed his stomach. I don't need your blessing, God. I don't even want your blessing, God. Just give me the bowl of soup. And he put his physical appetite before his inter eternal inheritance. Let me ask you something this morning, church. How do most people live their lives in America today? By their fleshly desires and how they feel in the moment. I want to satisfy my flesh and I don't care about God. I don't need you, God. All I want are my fleshly appetites satisfied. You see, this is the change that Christianity is supposed to bring into our lives. The Spirit takes over the flesh. And one way we honor God is by disciplining our bodies. The goal of your life is not a satisfied body, church. The goal of your life is a sanctified soul. It's still the same lie when Adam and Eve were deceived by the devil in Genesis chapter 3. Hey, God is withholding from you. Go ahead and eat from the tree. There are no consequences. You do you. Come on. It's just sex. It's your body. Hey, you just go on and, and change your gender. There's no consequences. You will then be who you want to be. It's just pornography. You're not hurting anyone else. It's just you and the screen. Oh, you need to buy this. You have the money. This is exactly what you need. People who believe this lie that the choices that we make in the flesh don't matter. 
are fooling themselves. I once heard a pastor share this story. That he had a lady in his church who was single, and she had gotten into her late 30s, and she began to date this guy, and then he learned that she was engaged. So he had the opportunity to meet this guy and to get to know him a little bit, and that is when his pastor and fatherly figure came in, and he knew that this lady was making a terrible mistake. And so he went to her as, his, as her pastor, and he said to her, do not marry this guy. The two of you are unequally yoked. You are making a mistake. This will end in disaster. And this is what she said to him. I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm in my late 30s. I want to have children. My body is getting older, and I am lonely. And she said, if you had told me this when I was in my 20s, I would have listened to you but I am going to marry him. And she did. And it ended up being a disaster. And the pain she experienced from that marriage was far greater than anything that singleness or loneliness would ever have brought into her life. Satan's scheme is to rob you of righteousness and joy. He wants to rob you of your passion and vitality for Jesus. And listen to me, church. He does it bit by bit by giving to you modern pleasure. But oh, it feels so good. But all it is doing is making us spiritually broke. Esau was more concerned about his stomach than he was his soul. How about you? So number one, put God at the center of your life. Number two, make eternal, not temporary decisions. And finally, number three, another way to avoid regret in life is to redeem it. We close out here in verse 17. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. I want you to notice something about verse 17. Esau tried to make it right with God, but God wouldn't listen. Right in the middle of verse 17, you will see the word rejected. It means to cast something away after thorough examination. Esau came to God in tears. But God saw the motive of Esau's heart. It was remorse, but it was not repentance. Look a little further down here in verse 17. The NIV doesn't capture this phrase very well. But there's a phrase right in the middle of verse 17. It's three words. Change of mind. It's the Greek word metanoia. And it's a Greek word that means to repent. Esau did not come to God in repentance. He came to God in remorse. Now what is the difference between those two things? Remorse and repentance. When we feel remorse, we are sorry for what has happened to us. We are sorry because of what we have done to ourselves. Remorse is a self-centered sorrow. It's all about us. The tears of remorse are a pity party for us. But here's what repentance is. 
Repentance happens when we come before God and we are sorry because of what we have done against him. David said in Psalm 51, 4, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That's repentance. It's not God that Esau was seeking through tears. He was sad because of what he had lost to Jacob. Repentance is different because it's the heartfelt sorrow of what we have done against God. Repentance is heartfelt grief because our sin has broken our relationship with God. Listen to me, church. Repentance is available to all who seek it. You are not defined by your regrets. You are defined by the cross of Jesus Christ. God's mercies are new every morning. And His grace and His mercy is available to us. And you don't find this grace. You don't find this mercy through remorse. You can only experience it through repentance. Very near the end of his life, Lee Strobel went and did an interview with Charles Templeton. And this was a question he asked him. How do you feel now that you have no faith? And Charles Templeton said, I miss him. I miss Jesus. And tears filled his eyes. When Charles Templeton was on his deathbed, this is what he said. Madeline, that was his wife. Do you see them? Do you hear them? The angels, they're calling my name. I'm going home. Look at them, look at them. They're so beautiful, and they're waiting for me. Oh, their eyes, their eyes are so beautiful. And then with a great voice, he cried out, I'm coming. After his death, this is what Charles Templeton's wife said. I believe he finally made peace in his own way with God, and that he was going home to be with Jesus. When I get to heaven, he's the first person I'm going to look for. It is believed at the end of his life that Charles Templeton repented and got his life right with God before he died. Do you have regrets in your life that need to be healed today? My friend, it's found in the mercy of God. Do you have regrets in your life that need to be forgiven today? It's found in the grace of God. If you are breathing, there is healing. And the grace and mercy of God is the power that God has to redeem us of all our regrets. Perhaps you're here this morning and you've never made that most important decision you will ever make in your life. And it's the decision of Jesus. Of repenting over our sin. Of believing that Jesus was God's Son. That He died upon the cross for our sins. 
that he was resurrected back to new life on that third day. My friends, if you've never made that decision, don't live one more day of your life without Christ. If you are breathing, there is healing. Receive Jesus as your Savior. And receive His free gift of eternal life. If you are here today, And you are struggling with regret. With sins and mistakes that you have made in your life. The grace and mercy of God is available for you today. Confess it. Repent of it. And God will heal you. Perhaps you're here today and you're living a godless life. I have one word for you this morning. Repent. Get yourself off of the throne of your life and put Jesus at the center of it. Charles Templeton died on June 7, 2001. And when he stood before Jesus, I can only imagine the regret of a life wasted. Billy Graham died on February 21, 2018. And when he entered the presence of Jesus, I can only imagine the joy and the delight when Jesus said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. How do you avoid regret in life?